Welcome to those of you that have already joined this webinar. I'm Kuljit Bogle KC. I jointly head up the housing team here at Cornerstone Barristers, and I'm going to be delivering this webinar with my two brilliant co-speakers, Andy Lane and Sarah Salmon. Uh, you'll have seen in the information that's been sent to you prior to the webinar that the webinar is being recorded and the slides and the PowerPoint presentation that we're going to be speaking to will be made available to you afterwards. And I should flag that there are a very large number of slides because we've sought to include as much detail as we can on them, but we're not going to be speaking to every single one of them simply because time isn't going to allow us to do so. Um, some of you will be regular attendees to our webinars and others of you will be new. So just to let you know, for those of you that are new, we do as a housing team regularly host webinars and details of those are on our um, chamber's website under the resources tab and then you'll find events. Uh, there are two events that I wanted to flag. Our housing day is coming up on Monday the 14th of uh, October. Uh, we, we are fully booked. However, um, if those of you who are listening are interested in uh, attending, if you contact Will or one of us, we'll see what we can do about adding you to the list. But um, that's Housing Day on Monday, the 14th of October. And then we've got on the uh, Wednesday, the 13th of November, I'm hosting a day long antisocial behaviour masterclass, which will be an in-depth look at the tools and powers available under the 2014 Act, um, mainly for local authorities and social landlords. There'll be uh, in-depth sessions on the law and then some guest speakers that will be covering some of the practical application. And again, the information for that uh, event is on the Chamber's website on the events page. <clears throat> in relation to today's session, um, Sarah will be looking at some of the grounds uh, for seeking possession. Andy's gonna be looking at notices to quit and some of the other aspects of the bill, and then I'll look at enforcement. But just to give you a bit of an overview, first of all, as to um, what this is all about, uh, this bill is uh, the implementation of the Labour Party's manifesto commitment to reform the private rented sector and to give greater rights and protections to the people who are renting their homes. And it builds on the Renters Reform Bill, which was introduced by the Conservative government, but which didn't complete all of its parliamentary stages before Parliament was dissolved. And so uh, it didn't get over the line in terms of being enacted. So it builds on that, but there are some differences which we're going to flag uh, as we go along. And the driver behind all of this was this uh, idea that um, short, short hold tenancies in particular do not offer long term security of tenure. And that lack of security means that tenants are unable to enforce some of their rights in relation to repairs and um, unreasonable rent increases. And uh, it, it's um, noted in the uh, background papers that the private sector particularly has a higher proportion of properties that don't meet uh, the standards required of homes. And it's against that background uh, that this bill has been introduced. And if I could ask you to move on to the next slide. And thank you. So it comes in four part, five parts, the bill. Uh, part one is about tenancy reform. We've heard a lot about the abolition of Section 21 and no fault evictions. We're going to touch on that, but really we're going to be covering much more than that in this session, particularly the things that are relevant to local authorities and to social landlords. And um, you'll hear a bit about the strengthening of the tenants' rights in relation to rent increases and the like that are covered in part one. Part two covers residential landlords and the headline points are that there's going to be an ombudsman scheme, which is free to tenants to use. Landlords will pay a fee to be a member and they have to uh, have become a member at the time the property is marketed for letting. Failure to be a member means that you won't be able to get a possession order except on ASB grounds and councils will be able to take enforcement action, which uh, I'll be dealing with a bit later. It's a one way process. So uh, landlords can, um, tenants can complain about their landlords, but landlords are not allowed to complain about their tenants. Um, so just, just to flag that. Um, in addition to the uh, Ombudsman service, there's going to be a register of uh, private landlords that uh, is going to be kept um, in order to um, eventually replace what's known as the database of rogue landlords. Part four covers the decent home standard and then um, 
forgive me, part three covers a decent home standard and part four covers enforcement. And then part five looks at some uh, technical clauses. And as I said, on the next slide, we've, we've got that there are going to be simpler tenancy structures. So all assured tenancies will be periodic. There will be no more assured short hold tenancies and fixed term assured tenancies are going to be uh, abolished. On the next slide, we've put some of the detail in there. As I say, the um, reforms are intended to provide, and this is a quote from the background documentation, tenants with greater security and stability and to empower them to challenge bad practice without the fear of retaliatory eviction. And this is the idea that if people, if tenants complain about the conditions, say, of their premises or um, are unhappy about a proposed rent increase, at present they're facing um, the service of a Section 21 notice and potential uh, eviction. So, so part one of the Act deals with the removal of fixed term tenancies. And it, it said that the, the problem with fixed term tenancies is that it obliges people to stay in properties, even when their property is not up to standard and when they might need more flexibility in terms of their accommodation because there's been a relationship breakdown, for example. And the whole um, ethos is to try and improve stability and security for tenants. And so that's the background against which uh, this is all being brought in. Uh, on the next slide, as I say, there's no more Section 21. Uh, the, the headline point here is that there's going to be a single implementation date uh, for everyone in the private sector, which differs from the Conservative government's proposals of there being a sort of transitional period. And on the on D-Day, all existing tenancies will convert to the new system, although there's going to be a separate date for registered providers. Um, we haven't been told what those dates are. The next slide confirms that there's going to be some statutory guidance issued uh, in order to uh, assist landlords and tenants in terms of implementation of the, the various measures. And then on the next slide, um, just a headline point in relation to some of the things Sarah is going to be looking at in a bit more detail. And that is that the grounds for possession are maintained, the two types, the mandatory and discretionary grounds are maintained. <clears throat> and the idea is that um, there's going to be better protection for tenants when their rent arrears are of a temporary nature and there's a prospect of still being able to maintain the tenancy and the tenancy being viable. And the grounds for, there are also grounds for possession when the landlord's circumstances change. And as I say, uh, Sarah's going to be covering some of those grounds in a bit more detail. Over to you, Sarah. So, um, good morning, everyone. I'm looking at the grounds for possession and um, Apologies, warning at the beginning that we're not going through every uh, slide probably uh, deals with my section more than it deals with anyone else's section because on my calculation and you can tell me if I'm wrong maths is always something that makes me sweat but I have just added up so I hope it's right there are 16 new grounds for possession which will mean 36 grounds in total under the housing act 1988. In addition to that, there are changes to current grounds. And the first thing I say, which is why I'm only highlighting a few of them today, is not all of the amendments will be relevant to social landlords. They will just deal with the private landlord situation. But um, if you want to see, well, the slides set out all the new grounds and the changes that have been made. But if you want to see a list of all the grounds, then you can find that in table one of the government's current guidance to the bill, which sets out each and every ground, whether or not changes have been made. So I'm selecting four grounds um, this morning to focus on. And the first one I'm going to highlight, Andy, if you can find it, is ground 2ZA. There we go, there it is. And I'm, I'm highlighting this one because there's been a number of grounds that have been introduced relating to when a superior lease or a superior tenancy comes to an end or is terminated. And that's not an uncommon scenario in social housing, which is why I'm highlighting these grounds. The other grounds that deal with similar scenarios can be found at grounds 2ZB through to 2ZD, but I'm just going to look at 2ZA this morning. So under ground 2ZA, the landlord um, seeking possession must be a particular type of landlord, and that includes a private registered provider for social housing, but it can also be a company of which a local authority owns 
um, at least 50% of the issued shares. And you'll see on the slide, it, it includes agricultural tenancies as well. And the ground is engaged in two circumstances. The first is where a valid notice to terminate has been given, which will end the superior tenancy. And that has to be given with, within 12 months of the relevant date, which I'll come to. And the second um, time it will be engaged is where a fixed term will expire again within 12 months of what is said to be the relevant date. Now, just to flag to everyone on the webinar, the relevant date does change dependent on some of the grounds. But for the purposes of this ground, the relevant date means the date of service of the Section 8 notice, so your notice of seeking possession. If notice is dispensed with, then the relevant date is when the proceedings are begun, so um, when they are issued. Um, and you'll see that in order to get a possession order uh, under this ground, you have to give uh, four months notice in your Section 8 notice. The second set of grounds I wish to highlight, and we're going to look at two, are those which deal with possession in relating to supported housing and also homelessness housing, home, uh, housing under the homelessness duties. Now, the two I'm going to focus on, Andy, if you can find 5E, that's the first one I'm going to go through. There it is there on the bottom of that slide. But just so everyone on the webinar knows, there's a number of grounds in related to supported accommodation. They start at 5E and they go through to 5F, 5G. You then have 5H, which deals with something called stepping stone accommodations, getting people ready to move on. But also ground 18 is also a supported housing ground. So you have these five E's to H and then you have ground 18. So by way of example, in relation to supported housing, 5E provides a ground where you as a landlord need possession of the property because it is held for use as supported housing. And the tenant that is in there currently did not enter the tenancy for support, uh, for the purpose of supported housing. And you'll see on there, that means receiving care, support or supervision. And four weeks notice has to be given under that ground. If we move on to 5G, this is the homelessness ground as opposed to supported housing ground and this provides a ground for possession where a local authority has placed someone at accommodation under their section 193 housing act 1996 duty which is often referred to as the main housing duty and the local authority uh, has then notified the landlord that the tenant is no longer required in relation to that homelessness duty. And the relevant date for serving uh, a notice, so you have to serve a notice under this ground within 12 months of that local authority notification. So what I would say in relation to this ground, and there's a similar ground, although it's not currently worded exactly the same under Renting Homes Wales, which is causing some issues, is that you need to make sure that if you are housing people um, because the local authority has found that they're owed a duty under 193, that if you're not the local authority yourself and you're, you're, you're a housing association, that you have really good links with the local authority to make sure you are notified that this duty is coming to an end. So you make sure you serve your notices within the correct time period. It would be interesting to see whether the wording um, stays exactly how it is, which is about the local authority notifying the landlord in Wales. It is slightly different. Uh, I, I think it's when the local authority notify the contract holder, which is why it's caused some, some problems. Finally, I am highlighting ground eight which is not a new ground. We all know what ground eight says. It's your mandatory rent arrears ground, but there has been some changes. The first is in relation to the notice period. Instead of two weeks notice, there has to be four weeks notice. 
The second change is that the amount of rent arrears required at the date of the notice and also, oh, sorry, at the date of service of the notice and also at the uh, possession claim final hearing stage, um, instead of being eight weeks or two months, it's 13 weeks and three months. But you'll note the final bullet point there on this slide in relation to the proposed change. And there's some additional wording that has been added to this ground, which essentially means that when calculating how much rent is unpaid, if a tenant is entitled to universal credit, and any amount is unpaid because the tenant has not yet received their award, then that amount must be ignored. So whilst if you are a landlord who is getting direct payments of the housing element, that might be quite easy for you to um, look at and, and work out whether something is unpaid because the reward has not yet been given. Um, if, it, if it's the tenant receiving all of their universal credit, including the housing element, of course, you might not know whether or not the reward has been received and whether the rent is still just remaining unpaid. So whilst I'm, all, I'm sure all social landlords have um, procedures and processes in place to ask questions of their tenants around benefits um, when they are looking at bringing possession proceedings. It's just to flag that you will really need to be clear as to whether or not um, the award simply hasn't been given or whether someone is actually not, not paying their rent even though they, they have the reward because that's going to be one of the first things I imagine that anyone at court assisting a tenant will be looking at when ground date is relied upon if that tenant is in receipt of, uh, in receipt of universal credit. So I'm now going to move on to what hasn't changed. And to be clear, the reason why I haven't put the notice period on ground 7A and ground 14 is because the substance of the ground has not changed. But in relation to ground 7A, the notice period is being reduced to bring it into line with ground 14. So you will be able to serve a notice and begin possession proceedings immediately under ground 7A. There is, there is provision that the court in relation to ground 7A cannot make a possession order until at least 14 days after the tenant has been given the ground 7a notice but in reality i mean it, it strikes me as a miracle if you get a possession claim into court within 14 days so even if you issued immediately I, i'm not necessarily sure that that provision will cause that much of an issue once you're you're at court so there has been a slight change there the rest of the grounds on that slide remains unchanged the other change again is in relation to uh antisocial behaviour and ground 14 but it's by way of section 9a which is clause 5 of the bill I set out on that slide and we all know what section 9a says currently it, it's the way the court must direct itself when it's looking at its discretion as to whether it's reasonable to make an order and the type of order that's made and the focus is on the uh, behaviour and the impact on other people that are not the person who is perpetrating the behaviour and you'll you'll recall there's an A, B and C there which which draws the attention away from the tenant or or the person perpetrating the behaviour. Um, what section 9A does is it's going to expand what the court must consider when deciding whether or not it'd be reasonable to make an order under ground 14 and the court must give weight to the impact on fellow tenants in HMOs. Now that may or may not be relevant to anyone listen, listening to this webinar but that strikes me slightly as being slightly otios because that again is just focusing on the impact on others which arguably the court has to take into account anyway under the current 9a. Um, but the second amendment, which is the final bullet point on that slide, is whether the tenant has failed to engage with other interventions to manage the behaviour. Now, most social landlords going to court will 
have detailed witness statements, especially in ground 14 cases um, and social behaviour cases about the impact of the behaviour, the effect of the behaviour, but also nowadays the circumstances of the tenant and other measures that have been attempted, because we all know, for example, that Equality Act offences are um, uh, something that that are more likely than not to be raised when we're looking at antisocial behaviour. And of course, we have these lesser measures in the back of our minds, so we set it out. So that may well be enough uh, to enable the court to look at whether or not the defendant has cooperated or engaged with other interventions. But it's just to flag there that there is this added element to it, which any landlord's evidence should address, because if not, the court is not going to be able to um, consider that aspect of it. And it may well uh, delay any possession claim you have. Um, so that's a whistle stop tour through the grounds. And I think I now turn to uh, hand over to Andy. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Sarah. Um, I should also say that uh, I think we're still in uh, anticipating some guidance on antisocial behaviour grounds, which the um, MHCLG are still working on. Um, so that will be in addition to the guidance you already have for the Act itself or the Bill itself at, at the moment. Um, I'm going to be having a look at um, some disparate areas, but starting off with uh, a tenant's notice to quit. Um, and the next three slides... Um, and, and I should say, if, um, uh, just to remind you, that these are going to be made available. Um, but the next three slides effectively say, um, I think, probably six things. Um, firstly, uh, what's going to happen is, is that there'll be an increase in the, the period that the tenant has to give if they want to serve a notice to quit on their landlord. At present, that would be four weeks and that will be extended to two months. Uh, secondly... Uh, the landlord and tenant can agree uh, in writing uh, to a shorter period. And of course, it may be a benefit to both parties to do so. Um, but the extended time is, is clearly uh, there to assist the landlord to find a new tenant. Um, uh, and uh, amendments are being made to the Protection from Eviction Act uh, for that purpose. <laughs> Thirdly, um, as you'll know, unlike a notice seeking possession, um, which has no legal effect, um, in other words, the tenancy persists, a notice to quit uh, brings uh, a tenancy to an end uh, at uh, the uh, end of the period and um, normally uh, can't be withdrawn, but there is going to be provision that the tenancy, the tenant's notice to quit can be withdrawn uh, with the agreement again, the written agreement again of the landlord. Um, and again, there may be obvious reasons why that's the case. Circumstances change and the landlord's quite happy for the tenant to continue in occupation of the premises. Um, there is, um, fourthly, uh, no ability on the part of a landlord uh, to dictate uh, the form um, in which the notice um, to quit is uh, provided. Uh, and of course, that could cause some issues. Um, I've seen some concerns being saying, well, what happens if I get a WhatsApp message or what happens if I get any other social media message? Is that going to be enough? And of course, at the moment, the answer to that is yes, it's it's in writing and that therefore that should be sufficient. Um, but certainly uh, what you can't do is you can't say in the tenancy agreement, uh, if you do uh, serve a notice to quit, uh, this is how you have to provide it. Um, that is just has to be in writing, and that's the only provision. Um, fifthly, um, uh, well, the last two things uh, are really, first of all, to remember that surrender remains. Of course, um, as in any tenancy agreement, the parties can agree uh, to surrender the agreement. Um, and that's obviously a matter for both parties. Uh, it's not normally something that social landlords like to do because, of course, they don't want to be fixed with any subtenancies that have been uh, probably unlawfully uh, perpetrated by the tenant. But um, certainly surrender in other cases can happen and often happens, of course, uh, when a tenant uh, dies and the family gives the keys back. Um, so surrender remains. And also remember, of course, that Section 5, subsection 1 of the Housing Act 1988 remains. Um, in other words, um, whilst uh, the assured status uh, remains. In other words, the tenant is living at the property as their own or principal home or one of a joint tenants or the tenant through the Family Law Act. 
And then in those cases, uh, the landlord can't end the tenancy by way of a notice to quit, and they have to go down the notice seeking possession route. Um, so uh, that is what's happening with notices to quit. And you'll see from the three slides in this section, uh, the amendments to section five of the Protection of Eviction Act, um, a new subsection, section five um, uh, A and five one ZA, uh, and as I say, the summary points uh, in the last slide. Um, perhaps uh, of more interest uh, and more relevance um, to social landlords are four areas um, uh, to varying degrees. Um, private rented sector offers, which of course are those offers made by uh, local um, housing authorities when it comes to the operation of their full housing duty under Section 193 of the Housing Act 1996. Rent increases, um, which of course applies to any assured uh, tenancy. Uh, shared ownership, which is a hot topic at the moment um, and one of my slight obsessions, uh, and issues to do with homelessness, which although, of course, are not the mainstay of these um, reforms, uh, are inevitably caught by some of the uh, some of the changes that are being proposed, uh, not least because of the ending of a short, short hold tenancies and the ending of fixed term tenancies. So having a quick look at those matters, private rented sector offers. Now, as I say, um, uh, a private rented sector offer at the moment is something that will bring an end uh, to a local authorities, local housing authorities, uh, full housing duty to an applicant for housing assistance. And what it has to be at the moment is an assured short hold tenancy. It has to be for a fixed term of at least 12 months. It has to be offered by a private landlord under arrangements with and approved by the local housing authority. And one sees that um, in section 193, um, subparagraph 7AC of the Housing Act 1996. Well, under the new provisions, of course, um, it can't be an assured short hold tenancy, so that one goes. And of course, it just becomes an assured tenancy, uh, which will be the only form of assured tenancy there'll be. Uh, and of course, again, there's no point saying for at least 12 months because there's going to be no fixed term tenancies for assured tenancies. It's all right if you're a secure tenancy, if flexible tenancies remain, but for assured tenancies, um, uh, there is no such thing as a fixed term agreement, uh, and therefore the minimum period goes. And that's what you see in Clause 23 of the bill. There'll be no minimum period. Uh, what you'll also be aware of if you deal in this area is, is that normally speaking with the PRSO, there is provision for an automatic right, regardless of your circumstances, to reapply for uh, assistance and the, and the full duty uh, within two years of accepting the private rent sector offer. Um, well, that's going. Um, and that's going not least because of the ending of the fixed term period, but there'll be no such automatic acceptance. And that, that potentially is significant. I don't know what the figures are on that and how many people will be impacted, but that is certainly something that uh, will um, uh, be a real uh, change. Um, and um, you also see there in the fourth bullet point, um, there are changes uh, to do with um, uh, matters to do with a, a refusal to cooperate. At the moment, you may be aware that if you refuse to cooperate uh, with uh, the local authority when it comes to their uh, preliminary duties, uh, their, their relief duties and their prevention duties, um, then it could mean that you don't get owed the full housing duty under Section 193 um, 2, but you're actually, you are given a kind of a lesser duty. Um, that uh, will no longer be the case. What will actually happen is, is that uh, the only effect of you not cooperating when it comes to the relief and prevention duties is that uh, those duties end. Um, it doesn't prevent uh, you, for example, if you are the one not cooperating, getting the full housing assistance under Section 193 uh, as a full uh, housing duty. Um, uh, I've also said at the end uh, of this slide, uh, just to um, uh, note one change, is, is that um, accommodation in England um, secured under Part 7 uh, will fall within Sections 1 and 2B of the Housing Act 2004. And obviously that can have effect in terms of uh, local authority powers to ensure uh, decent standards and, and conditions, um, as it indeed is the purposes of Part 1 of the Housing Act 2004. The next two slides deal with rent increases. And the reason why it's, it uh, goes over two slides is that one might have expected this not to be particularly important and uh, not be particularly controversial. And maybe um, 
people uh, will be able to explain it in a way that means that it's not. But uh, currently, um, landlords um, can only increase rent. Uh, this is not private registered providers, but la private landlords can only increase rent uh, in the fixed term uh, by having a clause uh, and in periodic by a Section 13 notice. Uh, well, of course, we're only going to have periodics. And of course, Section 13 notices are going to remain. Uh, but there is going to be separate provision, as we'll see in the next slide, um, uh, for private registered providers. But well, that's Section 13A, actually, you see on the first bullet point. Um, private registered providers will still be able to, unlike uh, the private sector, increase rent by reason of a, a, a appropriate provision in the tenancy uh, agreement. Um, for example, it may say that you're entitled to increase it um, on the consumer price index plus one percent, or of course whatever the um, rent standard is, as operated through the uh, regulator. Um, that may be possible for private for a private registered provider of social housing, such as a housing association, that will not be available to private landlords. They will have to issue a Section Thirteen notice. The difficulty is, is, is not so much the last bullet point, which is that um, the first tier tribunal will be able to determine whether a Section 13 notice is valid. Uh, the problem is, and it's least equally, I should say, not particularly a problem that the tribunal at the moment can actually fix a rent which is higher than even the landlord wants to demand. Um, uh, that in itself um, is not the problem. It's, it's the second bullet point on this page you see. If covered by the 1988 Act provisions as amended and the tenant challenges the increase by application to the tribunal, any increase determined will be from the date of termination, not as currently um, of determination, not as currently the date in the Section 13 uh, uh, notice. Difficulty potentially of that is that if you're going through um, the rent procedure and there is additional provisions there which enables the tribunal to further uh, delay matters which all the, although they can do that at the moment it would normally not go beyond um, the notice period the notice provided uh, the, the date provided in the notice the difficulty is is that you're going to get tenants on different rent increases at different times now that's not a difficulty if you are somebody who is a private landlord with one tenant or a couple of tenants or a handful of tenants um, that's not going to be particularly difficult. If you're a, um, a, a landlord with um, many properties and you normally increase rents at the same time, or obviously more likely you're a housing association where that happens and some of your tenants have exercised a right, if they have it, because you haven't got a suitable term in your agreement, um, they've got you've had to go down the uh, notice route and they've gone to the tribunal. Some of the tenants will obviously be uh, having increases at different times of the year from other tenants. And that, of course, can impact quite significantly on the administrative process um, that there would be uh, for those tenants. Uh, and so it's a quite a significant change. It's one that I think still up for discussion, particularly with housing associations. Um, but um, largely speaking, most of it is common sense. It is that date of determination and the moving of it from the date in the notice to the date when the tribunal makes the decision or indeed even beyond that those could cause um, some difficulty. Um, going, as I say, to my uh, favourite topic at the moment, if it's not fraud, it's shared ownership. Um, well, of course, what are the impacts um, of the ending of fixed term agreements? And even more so, one of the impacts of the change in Clause 28, which redefines what is excluded as an assured tenancy. In other words, what is included in Schedule 1 to the Housing Act 1988, is that it's now going to be tenancies where the fixed term is more than seven years. In other words, um, that is going to be shared ownership uh, agreements amongst other agreements. Uh, and the apparently the justification of this was nothing to do with shared ownership at all. It was because ground rents had risen on agreements um, over the years, and many of them had increased above the rental limits that are presently stopping long leases being assured tenancies um, because they are below the low rent limits of Schedule 1, which at the moment are £1,000 or less, or if you're outside Greater London, £250 a year or less. Um, and it was felt, uh, and there's different situations for pre-1st um, of April 1990 uh, agreements. And that was really the main reason why this was changed, it was felt felt much simpler to say, look, if you've got an agreement of more than seven years, you cannot be an assured tenant. Well, that's fair enough for long leases. 
And maybe that's almost anticipated for long leases. But of course, for shed ownership, as we know, the product itself is based on the fact that they are assured short-hold tenancies. The loss of um, Section 21 doesn't impact uh, upon that and wouldn't have impacted upon that. Uh, but of course, the ability to go down uh, the notice-seeking possession route, whether that be rent arrears, antisocial behaviour or, or whatever, is going to be um, quite significant. Uh, and therefore, it means that possession of a shared ownership property, regardless of whether the tenant lives at the property or not, will have to be by way of forfeiture, will have to be by way of a declaration first that there has been a breach. Uh, and that will be how you get it. And of course, one of the difficulties that will cause is that there may be issues of waiver, which at the moment, of course, when it comes to notice seeking possession, isn't an issue. Whether there's a wider impact uh, in that at the moment there is a debate, as some of you may have been following, as to whether, in fact, because of the uh, upper tribunal case, indeed the Court of Appeal case of Avon ground rents, uh, there is some suggestion that um, uh, you have to issue to get rent, not just ground rent, but rent, uh, a Section 166 notice. Um, there has been a lot of debate about that, and indeed we did a recent webinar on this subject. Um, and I have my own views that that isn't required, but there is still a debate on that. Uh, and that will continue uh, with the changes, because, of course, that is a provision uh, under the Common Hold and Leasehold Reform Act. Uh, and therefore, uh, although the debate is largely centred around Section 76 and the meaning of long lease, um, it, it can be seen that that debate will continue and obviously administratively cause tremendous problems still. Uh, for housing associations operating shared ownership and the loss of assured status uh, won't change that. I should say uh, by way of um, saving provision for those of you who have shared ownership products or those of you who are seeking possession of shared ownership products, if there is a live notice seeking possession, in other words, uh, it, it's still uh, in use, it's, it's still got, um, it's within the 12 months, um, uh, or indeed there's an, uh, an ongoing possession claim, or indeed there is a possession order, those are still matters which can be pursued as assured tenancies, uh, and they will be treated as assured tenancies uh, until the matter is concluded, whether that's execution of any possession order or, or dismissal of any claim. Um, so that will be something uh, that you will not be affected by the changes if you have reached that stage at the moment this is introduced. Uh, and um, lastly, under this section, um, I've headed it uh, threatened with homelessness. Um, and this is just to make the, in a sense, again, fairly simple but obvious point. Um, you'll be aware that if you are threatened with homelessness, you may be owed the prevention duty uh, at Section 195. And that may put on certain requirements of a local housing authority. Uh, and of course, one of the questions are, is, um, are you threatened with homelessness? And currently, receipt of a Section 21 notice, which has um, uh, less than 56 days, meets that definition. Well, of course, there's no point having that in the new regime um, post summer of next year. Um, so what they've done is simply said, well, OK, not Section 21, but Section 8. So if you've got a Section 8 notice seeking possession, and then um, it will come um, within that provision and you will be treated as threatened with homelessness. Uh, and it will therefore mean um, that uh, you will uh, be able to seek the assistance of the local housing authority, who obviously will be trying to work with the landlord to make sure that the notice isn't acted upon um, in appropriate cases. Uh, but you can see the changes that are, are, are being applied. I've highlighted them in whatever that colour is, uh, mauve purple. Um, and it makes it clear the date specified in the notice is within 56 days. So again, it's the same period of time. But rather than being a mandatory notice, it now applies to a discretionary notice. Um, I should just say before passing back to Cooljit that there is um, uh, amendments proposed uh, to Section 19301A, uh, um, which is, uh, as I indicated earlier, the lesser duty owed if you didn't uh, comply with your duties under, uh, this is the applicant, if you didn't comply and cooperate under the relief or um, prevention duties. Uh, and indeed, under the end of duty provisions uh, of section 1936, um, uh, 7AB and 7AC. Uh, um, and therefore, of course, you can't end the duty um, by uh, an offer of an assured um, tenancy. 
and that's been removed from section uh, uh, 1936 double C. Uh, and uh, of course, with the PRSO changes, it also has an impact upon that part of the provision as well. So there are some changes to homelessness. They're not necessarily major, but they can be in certain circumstances and in individual cases significant. Uh, and they're, although they're not the main purposes of the Act, they are the natural follow-on uh, from the main reforms. And I'll now return to Kuljit. Thank you, Andy. Um, I'm going to be looking at some of the enforcement obligations that are coming in with the bill. And uh, as with other parts of the proposals, it's very much about looking at how the challenge or the problems being framed to then look at how uh, solutions have been formulated. So in terms of the background to this part of the bill, the challenges were identified <clears throat> as being a lack of knowledge of the private rented stock preventing informed strategic uh, decision making by local authorities when it comes to their existing enforcement powers. Them having a limited enforcement capacity, which restricted some local authorities to simply firefighting as opposed to being more proactive, and a lack of a political or corporate commitment to improving housing conditions. So it's against that background that um, there are going to be new enforcement and investigatory powers introduced by the bill. It's part four and schedule five. And um, what they'll do is they'll strengthen existing powers to investigate and also um, create powers to impose fines in certain circumstances. So there'll be a wider range of um, standards that local authorities are going to be obliged to check for when they check for breaches. And clause 104 will impose a new general duty on local housing authorities to enforce landlord legislation in its area. So what's landlord legislation? That's defined in clause 1045 of the uh, proposed bill. And it includes parts three and six of part one, uh, which is the discrimination in the rental market when it comes to um, landlords saying that they're not prepared to take children or not prepared to take DSS tenants and in relation to rental bill bidding. Part two is covered, which is the requirement to be a member of the Ombudsman scheme when marketing a property and also to be on the register of landlords. Landlord legislation also covers Section 1 and Section 1A of the Protection for Eviction Act, which uh, Andy's just been talking about. And then Chapter 1, Part 1 of the 1988 Act, which relates to security of tenure, uh, rent increases and, and grounds for possession. So under clause 105, a local authority um, that is looking to uh, undertake its uh, powers to uh, investigate has a requirement to notify uh, any other local authority in whose area the property is situated. So for example, um, if, if uh, a, a investigation has been carried out at district level, uh, there may be a requirement to notify the county authority in relation to any um, investigations that are carried out. Under clause 106, county councils have the power, not the duty, but a power where it's not a housing authority um, to notify, uh, but where they, they propose enforcement action to notify the housing authority in whose area the breach has occurred. And there are reporting requirements the other way as well. And then to monitor all of this under clause 107, there are reporting requirements created to the Secretary of State, who is then going to um, oversee the extent to which these powers are being utilised. Uh, and what it will do, uh, this part of the bill, is to extend the powers of local authorities to both um, collect and retain revenue that it receives from the financial penalties that they impose uh, on landlords. Uh, in respect of being able to use them for future enforcement work. On the next slide, uh, we've got um, some further provisions. Um, clause 108 creates provision for what are described as lead authorities, and there are going to be some regulations published in relation to uh, the obligations on lead authorities. But one of the issues is to, one of the ideas behind this is to uh, for lead authorities to issue guidance and provide information and advice to local housing authorities to insist them in carrying out their enforcement activities consistently. So that's going to be one of the uh, responsibilities of the lead authorities. 
and um, it's also going to look at um, how it can potentially plug the gap in relation to capacity and capability for enforcement work, particularly in relation to complex or high profile cases. And it's suggested that in those instances, a lead authority might provide an opportunity to create a centre of expertise on the relevant legislation and to act as a backstop for enforcement. So in, in a sense, it looks as though the intention is to create a portal for knowledge and, and to have that knowledge built up so that uh, other authorities can dip into it uh, as and when uh, required. <clears throat> On the next slide, I've, I've got um, some information there about the uh, ability to impose financial penalties. And you'll see that the penalties, uh, the civil penalty can be uh, up to uh, 7,000 pounds in the first instance, but in relation to persistent uh, or repeat non-compliance, there's going to be the ability to impose a financial penalty of up to £40,000. So it does seem as though these provisions have some uh, actual teeth in terms of the sums involved. And so that's uh, those are the penalties that are potentially going to be um, uh, imposed in the event that there is a breach. O on the next slide, I've got some information about the investigatory powers that are being introduced by Chapter 3, that's clauses 111 to 129. And uh, what uh, Clause 111 says is that a local authority can give notice to a relevant person requiring them to provide information. Uh, and that relevant person uh, is defined as anybody that has an estate or interest in the property, uh, the licensor of a property, of a property uh, anybody acting on behalf of either of those, or anybody involved in marketing the property. So it's quite a broad uh, range of people that can be required to provide information. And uh, that, that clause 111 works with clause 112, which is the power to require information from any person. And then the uh, in relation to the failure to provide the information, the bill creates the power or the ability of the local authority to apply to the court for an order for that information, if that information isn't provided on request. Clause 115 creates a power to enter premises. This is an interesting one because it's a right of access to business premises without a warrant uh, if, the, uh, if, if it's believed that the premises are occupied by a relevant person for the purposes of a rental sector business. And uh, there's also the ability to apply for a warrant of entry under Clause 117. And the intention behind those powers of entry are the ability to obtain evidence on site and the examples given in the guidance are things such as email exchanges, text messages, bank statements and uh, tenancy agreements. So these are fairly significant powers to not only be able to um, investigate, but to access information that might be required in order to facilitate that investigation. So those are uh, that's a snapshot of some of the uh, uh, enforcement and investigatory powers. On the next slide, just got um, a couple of slides here on the impact on the social housing sector. And we've summarized the changes that specifically affect local authorities. And Andy's covered some of those, as has Sarah, in relation to the PRSO changes, the enforcement responsibilities and the investigatory powers, and then the impact on homelessness. There are some changes that are specific to housing associations, the main one being no more ASTs, no more Section 21, and um, we've heard that there are changes uh, to the grounds for possession. And then in relation to both sectors, there are uh, there's, there's at least one area that applies to both, and that relates to nominations. And what uh, Andy's done helpfully on this slide is to flag for you some of the resources that are useful in terms of wanting to find out further information. So the government's published a guide to the renters' rights bill, which was last updated in September. There are also the explanatory notes to the bill itself. And then um, uh, hot off the press um, late last week, there was a Commons Library note published. And those are, for those of you that aren't familiar with them, those are documents that are intended mainly for members of parliament to be able to get up to speed quickly with various um, areas of government legislation. But it's, it's a user-friendly um, note with hyperlinks to various documents. And it's, a, it's another document that we would commend to you if you're looking to 
um, find out a bit more. On the next slide, um, we've got some information in relation to implementation. And um, th th the one thing that I wanted to flag is that we haven't got a date yet, but um, we're gonna, we'll are gonna we get a date. And um, what is flagged in the Commons Library note is the fact that a lot of landlords particularly have raised concerns about the ability of the court system to cope with um, the existing uh, possession process, let alone any changes that might be introduced to it. And it flags some of the responses to the consultation that were received from landlord organisations, as well as the response from the um, relevant government, government minister, which, which is um, uh, typically vague uh, and suggests that the um, Ministry of Justice are going to be working uh, to ensure the court system is ready at the point of uh, the new tenancy system coming into place. I, I suppose we'll just have to wait and see. Um, well, we all know the there are capacity issues with the current system and long, long um, waits for even supposedly urgent cases. As Sarah mentioned, you'd be lucky to get an antisocial behaviour case issued and heard uh, as quickly as um, uh, the, the theory would suggest. And, and so um, the uh, national NALA, the uh, association that represents landlords, has suggested that the government needs to look at um, what being ready means and to tell us what being ready means, because really it's a bit of a, a fudge at, mo at the moment, um, but also has asked for the government to commit to seeing waiting times falling and to improve the um, ca uh, capacity of, start of courts in terms of the number of, of um, staff and um, to improve uh, time waiting times as a result. So that that's, I think, that one of the, the biggest unknowns is, is really... Uh, it's all well and good in theory, but how much of this is actually going to be capable of getting through the court system is, is yet to be seen. Um, that brings our session to an end. I know we've been answering some of the questions as we've been going along. And for those of you that joined late, um, just to remind you that this session is recorded and you can watch it back at your leisure. The recording and the slides will be shared with you. And in addition to this session today, there are a number of other sessions that the housing team run throughout the year, uh, short webinars of an hour, an hour and a half. And then our main event every year is our housing day, which this year takes place on Monday. Uh, it is fully booked, but there may be scope to add some names to it. So if you are interested in attending, if you could get in touch with Will or one of us and we'll see what we can do. And as I mentioned also, there is a specific conference dedicated to the antisocial behaviour Act, marking the 10 years of the Act, taking place on Wednesday, the 13th of November, that I'll be hosting. And you'll be able to find details of that on our website as well. And before I uh, let you go, I'm just going to flag the Chamber's books just on the next slide. As you'll know, there are various books published by um, the various practice teams across Chambers, and some of those are highlighted there. I can also tell you that in the pipeline, there is a book that Sarah Salmon and Jack Barber are working on in relation to gang injunctions, uh, and that's in the process of being written. And so, so watch this space, we'll forward updates as and when we get them. And then, as I say, on the last slide, there are some details of the uh, way in which you can contact us, should there be any other questions or inquiries, or should you have instructions that you want to send to us. Um, Thank you all very much for joining. Before I sign off, do either of my co-speakers want to add anything else? I should just say that um, somebody asked in the questions just now about timescales or new timescales for our abs law. Um, I mean, obviously, such a crucial um, issue. Um, we haven't dealt with it here, of course, because it's mainly about extending it. Uh, rather, the bill is mainly about extending it to the private sector. Um, I mean, I think in terms of timescales, obviously, to a large extent, it rather depends when the bill comes in. But I think we're looking at the summer of um, 2025 as being the likely um, uh, timescale for that. Um, so, um, and no doubt there will be other briefings and uh, webinars on this as the bill progresses and maybe as reforms are made to the bill, although it seems fettled, fairly settled at the moment in its current form. Thank you, Andy. I'm going to sign off. Thank you all very much for joining us. As I say, do look out for the other events that the team is doing. 
and hopefully we'll see you again soon.